All right, it's your episode. Let's do this. <laughs> I have a cat. That is the name of this podcast. Welcome to I Have a Cat. <laughs> Welcome to the 67th episode of Beer and Fear. My no. name is Zach. So the 67th episode. No. Not fucking. <laughs> you almost got me. I was hoping. Almost got me. <laughs> I actually know what the episodes are numbered. <laughs> what did you say? My name is Zach. <laughs> I said my name is Zach. My name is Paige. Yeah. <laughs> this episode is about the fear, fear of the dark. The fear, fear the of the dark. The fear, fear of the dark, dark. Dark. Fear, dark. <laughs> Af- being afraid of the dark is what this, the fear of dark. <laughs> dark of the fear. Dark of the fear. <gasps> or nyctophobia, I think is the phobia for it. Nyctophobia. Yeah, that is. Um. Das right. Das right. How was your, uh, it's been a couple weeks. Yeah. Because we all got, everyone in this room got COVID. (laughs) (laughs) It's so contagious. It's horrible. It was awful. I had a good run. I was in quarantine for like 11 days. It was gross. Yeah, we're all feeling better. I was so fatigued. It wasn't fun. I think you you definitely got hit worse than Ali and I did. Mm, Booty. And I'm vaccinated. Yeah, we all are. Fucking Christ. But, um... Yeah, that wasn't fun. Ow. So we had a bonus episode last week, and um, now we're feeling better. What'd you do for Chris? Any any Christmas or New Year's highlights? I saw my family and accidentally gave them COVID. Well, you're not sure if it was you or Emily, right? I'm not sure if it was me or Emily or Madison, mm. my sister's girlfriend, because mm. she also had COVID. Ah. Uh. How's your how's your dad doing? Uh, he hasn't reported any new symptoms. Okay. Loss of taste. Yeah. Uh, and some congestion. My mom was she definitely has it that she she tested negative before and then he tested positive so she didn't know if she wanted to go get tested again and she just figured you know she most likely has it so she'll just work from home. Mm-hmm. She has to quarantine anyways. Mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. But she's fine. She is probably positive, but asymptomatic. Lucky bastards. Did you just call my parents bastards? I called every asymptomatic person a bastard. Okay, don't, don't love my mom. <laughs> <laughs> Seems a little rude. What about New Year's? You sleep? I you slept? Slept. We video you, called you? You video called me. Yeah, that's right. And then I started to fall asleep, and then you video called me a little bit after yeah. that. Because you were going to talk to somebody. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. uh, it was midnight. I remember. <sighs> and then I went to bed. Hmm. I don't stay up for New Year's. Yeah. I used to not also. Just sleep. My mom does that too. But It's too late. What about uh, any any fun and exciting... Oh, you sort of work again. Yeah, and it's been fucking crazy. It has been crazy. Based on everything you've been telling me. Any, awesome. Anything else like fun and interesting New Year stuff? New Year related? Do you make any resolutions? Uh, I didn't make any resolutions. No. No, I didn't do the resolutions thing this the year. The only one resolution I ever stuck to was to give up um, speeding. Speeding. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. I remember that. I remember when you did that. Well, that's good. I had one where I gave up soda, but now I've started drinking Sprite again. Yeah, I don't, I don't do the soda thing very often either. How's your week? Um, we gotta do this quick. I'm getting sleepy. Oh gosh, come on, Paige. I don't want to fall asleep at the end again. <laughs> I was gonna get coffee before I got here, but all the Starbucks were like closed. The shortages. It was fucking weird. Christmas was fun. Um. New Year's was fun. I did some uh, new... I don't know if they're 
are they Mexican traditions? Entirely Mexican? Tra- I know the grapes thing isn't necessarily because I know a lot of people out here do the grapes thing where you eat twelve grapes. But we we ate twelve grapes and then we threw water off of our balcony oh. and then we sweeped the floor and sweeped the floor outside and into the outside of my apartment oh. and then we grabbed empty suitcases and ran around my apartment and then we came back in and then threw change over our shoulder into the apartment. Uh-huh. And we were supposed to eat some lentils, but no, we didn't eat lentils, but it was very strange, but, uh, I liked it. It was fun. (laughs) And we were like just getting over our sickness, but yeah, we were sick for about a week. The end of the year. It was, it was bummy, but yeah. What a way to end the year. Betty White dies and you get COVID. Betty White died. (sighs) We, uh, we poured a shot of whiskey for, for her. Always pour one for the homies. Unbelievable. I can't believe that. Betty White died. That's such bullshit. How you gonna end the fucking year that way? <sighs> fucking lose my Betty. And then I saw these posts that were like, heaven now, and it's all the golden girls reuniting and hugging. I was like, ugh. Ugh. Because they're all dead. They are all dead. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Christmas, New Year's, it was fun. Those are holidays. Yep. We watched Matrix 4. Did you like it? It was bad. Oh, uh, poor Keanu. No, it wasn't good. So, for episode 67 on darkness, yeah. our beer is from Surly Brewing Company. Surly. Surly. And don't call me Surly. <laughs> Holly and I watched that. I love that movie. It's hilarious. Uh, Surly Brewing Co. is at 520 Malcolm Avenue Southeast in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Hey! 55414. I think this is our first Minnesotan beer. I Minnesotan. Think- Minnesotan. Minnesotan beer. That wasn't a Minnesotan accent. Uh, so they've been homebrewing since 94 when I was born. And oh. the headquartered opened in uh, 2005. And this is a little bit from their website. It says, great beer above all else. Surly, the frustration we felt when we couldn't find a good beer, much less a great one in Minnesota. So we made some. Hmm. Great beer is all that really matters. Well, that and pushing your limits a bit. Looking out for your people. Taking pride in where you're from. And having as much damn fun as you can while doing it. All right. Leading Minnesota forward. It's what got us to where we are today. Each day, Surly relentlessly pursues craft beer perfection, pushing boundaries, refusing to brew to style, except when we do. Surly has been a proudly independent craft brewery for 14 years. We wouldn't have it any other way. It serves 13 states and one province. A full roster. They have a full roster of year-round beers, including Furious, Hell, Extra, Grapefruit Supreme, and Axeman. Mm-hmm. And... Our seasonal styles, small batches, and brand collaborations continue to innovate. What's next? It's in the works. Until then, don't settle. Get surly. Ooh. It says, brewed for the north. Everything we brew, we do for the people from the north. We make beer for the hearty folk with distinct sensibilities and accents to match. We take inspiration from dive bars and dark corners and craft beer that is distinctly defiantly (sighs) from here. We change laws, we experiment, and we continue to brew the very best beer as different as the people from the north. And power of the pint. At Surly, we don't really do things the easy way. We should probably consider it, but honestly, it's just so damn boring. Instead, we do the work, we put in the hours, and we craft the absolute best beer we can. We stand for the beer community in the north, and everything we do is about bringing more and better beer to the people. This beer by Surly Brewing Co. is called Darkness. Oh. And it looks like they've been brewing this since 2006. Is it going to be dark? Yes. Wouldn't that be weird if it was like a cream ale? Yeah. It better not be a stout. I will kick you in the shins. Brewed for embracing the darkness. Our massive Russian Imperial Stout. Ah, son of a bitch. Contains waves of chocolate, coffee, cherry, raisin, and toffee. Plus a non-traditional dose of aromatic hops. Sounds gross. (laughs) Go on. (laughs) Sounds disgusting. Continue. (laughs) Tell me more. (laughs) Each annual release of Darkness has a different label slapped on the front. For example, 2007's release had the Grim Reaper. Okay. 2010 had a vampire. 2015 had a bat. 2020 had a gorgon. Cool. And 2021 has what appears to be Baphomet. Let me see. Um, I... Trying to remember, I think ours is. Let's see, surly darkness. Let me see which one this is. Okay. Yeah, ours is the twenty. Ours is the twenty twenty. So the twenty twenty one has the gorgon. Gorgon. 
Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. That doesn't look like a cord. No, it doesn't really. Um, so this is the 2020 batch. I don't know why Benny's didn't have the 2021 batch, but they're exactly the same. Uh -huh. They're brewed the, the same way. All Everything's the same per their website. Um, since 2014, they've also been releasing a whiskey barrel aged, uh, whiskey bar barrel aged versions, some aged in bourbon, fernet, or rum barrels, and others infused with flavors like mole, coffee, blueberry, crumble, and old fashioned flavors. Oh. <clears throat> so this is a stout. Gross. It's a Russian Imperial stout. We've had a Russian Imperial stout only once before. Yeah, wasn't it Vlad the Imperial? It was Vlad. Uh, I pulled this from uh, AmericanCraftBeer.com. What the hell is a Russian Imperial stout? Some history. The link between the stout and Russia begins with a well-documented visit to England by Peter the Great in, in 1698, where he fell in love with stout beers, with the stout name describing only its strength, not its color. But of course, Peter the Great's link to the RIS is disputed and the correlation often overlooked in many histories, though many Russian imperial stouts today bear his name. Mm. In the early 18th century, the English had struck brewing gold and experimenting with darker ales, with the first porter appearing around 1721, then the stout or stout porter not long after. The Anchor Brewery of London, under the ownership of Henry Thrall, appears to have first shipped strong ales to the Balkan states and even the imperial court in Russia. The first shipment of strong porter to Russia is claimed to have not survived the 1500 mile voyage yet their second attempt sporting a much higher alcohol and bitterness found success and quickly became popular in european russia so they had to brew it stronger so that it would last the long trip hmm. one such fan of this style was empress catherine the great who st started receiving shipments via barclay perkins anchor brewery after 1781 known then as the entire the original name for a matured strong stout again this would all be less complicated if not based on various accounts, but it all adds to the lore of the style. As soon as you said Ent, I thought of the trees from Lord of the Rings. And, oh, Ent? Yeah. <laughs> I need to watch that, too. Today, the bulk of Russian Imperial Stouts are produced in the U.S. With You'll the be happy to know it's on HBO Max. And all the Hobbits. Oh. Do you want to borrow my account? I might, I might. You can borrow my Netflix, Hulu, and Disney Plus if you ever want to use but, that. Allison. Today, the bulk of Russian imperial stouts are produced in the U.S., with the term imperial becoming synonymous with a double or stronger version of most any given style, like imperial IPA, imperial stout, imperial porter. The BJCP definition accounts for dark, higher alcohol, so 7 to 12%, generally hoppier stout, 50 to 90 IBU, conveying, conveying flavors of dark chocolate, fruit esters, coffee, dark fruits, and offering a chewy, velvety, and luscious mouthfeel. <laughs> Many within the style can come off as hot or overly boozy within six months of packaging, so brewers often recommend cellaring for at least that long to make for a mellower tasting. Chewy? Yeah, it's a thicker mouthfeel. That sounds gross. Uh, so that's why uh, um, the barley wine, like uh, Bigfoot, yeah, and, that was nasty. and the Goose Island one, that was gross. you age those a little bit longer so they mellow so they get out. chewy? So they mellow out a little more. So you can chew them when you drink them, yes. <laughs> Fucking gross. <laughs> this little article actually recommends darkness as one of um, the uh, Russian Imperial Stouts to try. Mm. It's one of the ones they recommended. This is 12% ABV, moderate IBU, mm -hmm. unknown SRM. It's going to be pitch black, Paige. It's, really? Yeah, it's going to be pitch black. It's brewed with Warrior, Am Amarillo, and Simcoe hops. Uh, brewed with two-row Golden Promise aromatic chocolate black and special bee malts, English ale yeast, along with roasted barley, oats, brewer's crystals, and something called DME. It's not, beer's not going to taste good after you chew that I gum. I know. I really want gum, though. I'm going to wait. Listen to this. This beer uh, I'm listening. has a score okay. of 99. Oh, that's such a fucking lie. World class. That's 99. just people who pretend they like stouts. 99 world good. class. They're like, they're like, this is distinguished. Mm, what a delicious taste. It is ranked number 15 in Russian Imperial Stouts and number 228 overall. I don't believe it. 228 overall. Okay, I tried zombie dust. And what did I say about that? You're, you're that right. was out. That was like what world? Yeah, it was world like class. sixteen. Yeah, or twenty something. It was world class, just like this. It has an average rating of four point four eight out of four thousand two hundred four ratings. This and better be the best damn stout I've ever had in my we life. We haven't had a beer this highly rated since Zombie Dust. This yeah, is the it's second been a while. second high, highest rated. You know, rated there's probably beer. a list on there of like high ranked beers. We mm -hmm. should like look through that so we can stop getting such duds. Well, it's nice to try. You know, I still want one that makes me go. <gasps> yeah. 
Uh, we'll need to. I want another one. I'm going to look on the list. I'm going to try and find the lowest ranked beer. Oh, God. <coughs> like Greens? Something. Ranked 228 overall. Greens is a whole mess, though. It was. That w- it wasn't even the right beer. It wasn't even the right beer. It's just really Where gross. Where you see this bottle? Okay. That's a hefty looking bottle. I want to touch it. It's a big ass bottle. Okay, it does look like a Gorgon. I just couldn't see a face. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. She's got very long nails. And a very long tongue. What did that tongue do, girl? She wearing a bracelet made of teeth. You didn't read the description. Let me see. Oh, no, this wasn't on their website. Oh. It did. It wasn't on the page. Don't look directly at her. Avert your eyes. The Gorgon entices fangs dripping with darkness and nectar. Okay, seducing baby. with undeniable cherry, chocolate, and coffee notes and an aromatic hop punch. One glance and she'll turn you to stone, leaving your darkness vertical in the hands of Keith, the Keith. brother-in-law who doesn't like craft beer all that much. Oh. You, a modern-day Perseus, armed with an appreciation for our epic Russian imperial stout and terrific peripheral vision, must find a way to drink deep, become <laughs> your own legend. Peripheral vision. That's funny. So this is the, the coolest fucking bottle I've ever seen. This is a lot of beer. This is about 24 ounces of beer. This is a lot of beer. I also have a very strong, strong impulse to take it. Just smash it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's got melted black wax on the top. Um, this was bottled on September 1st, 2020. Really? Because the end pieces just feel like plastic. This is wax. Yeah, melted wax. Like uh, Maker's Mark. Huh. Similar thing. So, I'll try. I'll try to take a photo. All right. Look at her. Here we go. How, do, how the fuck? Did you take the wax off? Can you take the wax off? I think you can, but it's like I want to I wanna try and... I want to try and get it first. Breaks bottle opener. <laughs> the bottle opener just snaps in half. Can I have the wax? You I want that wax? I want all of the wax. All of the wax. Yeah, I'll take it off after. I want to get a picture with it on there. Thanks. Ooh. Oh. Okay, that smells incredible. I don't believe you. That smells good. Doesn't smell boozy. It just smells like... You, you smell stout and the uh, spices. Not getting much. Oh, Jesus. Don't you give me a full glass of Zachary, damn it. Zachary Michael! Don't play coy with me. Sorry, what'd you say? You whore. So the head sticks around on this. It's a tan, dark tan head. It smells spicy. A little bit of fruit. I just feel like I'm staring into the abyss. You're staring into darkness. The abyss. Get it? Yeah, I don't. It smells kind of cream, almost like a pastry, like a creamy, sugary. I'm not getting anything. Maybe my smell is broken. Roasted, yeah, like roasted coffee. It is just dark as fuck. Yep, pitch black. Oi, oi, oi. Mmm. Ooh. Yeah, Paige doesn't like it. Hmm. I gotta be so bitter. My tongue hates it. <laughs> like it wants to reject it. This is so good. Can I scrape something out of my mouth? <laughs> like in reverse? Can we get like one of those dentist tubes that they put in your mouth to like soak up spit? But we do that, and we put that in my stomach, and we <laughs> take it back. It's chocolatey. I definitely taste the chocolate and the coffee in in the front. I just. And it's creamy. The mouthfeel on it is. No. Silky and creamy. Stay there. Paige doesn't like stouts. Have you any? Have you liked any other stout or porter that we've had? No. And I've picked a couple. It's a world class. Actually, did I pick more? Did I only pick Vlad? You picked Vlad. I literally only picked Vlad because it fit with my topic. I picked this because it fit with the topic. Shit's good. What are you rating it, uh, Paige? Ten. Oh, Actually, God. no. Do I have nine open? <laughs> <laughs> I just 
much. It'll look at me so I can Wait, not. did you try this with the gum in your mouth? No. Oh. I just put this in there. You're going to get mad at me if I did. <laughs> Nyctophobia is an extreme fear of night or darkness that can cause intense symptoms of anxiety and depression. As we all know, a fear becomes a phobia when it's excessive, irrational, or, or impacts your day-to-day -day life. As we know. As we know. And so it is. And so it will be. <laughs> Being afraid of the dark often starts in childhood and is viewed as a normal part of development. I'm still scared of the dark. Are you scared of the dark? Outside dark. Not inside dark. Mm. But outside dark. Mm. Put me in the woods at night. Huh! Studies focused on this phobia have shown that humans often fear the dark for its lack of any visual stimuli. In other words, people may fear night and darkness because they cannot see what's around them. Makes sense. The symptoms you may experience with nyctophobia are much like those you would experience with other phobias. People with this phobia experience extreme fear that causes distress when they are in the dark. Symptoms can interfere with daily activities and school or work performance. Please don't operate heavy machinery. When in darkness. Physical symptoms include trouble breathing, racing heart rate, chest tightness or pain, shaking, trembling, or tingling sensations, lightheadedness or dizziness, upset stomach, diarrhea, yay, cherry, bismol, hot or cold flashes, and sweating. And then emotional symptoms include overwhelming fears, sorry, overwhelming feelings of anxiety or panic. Where'd fears come from? You can probably have some fears that are overwhelming. These fears are so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. An intense need to escape the situation, detachment from self or feeling unreal, losing control or feeling crazy, feeling like you may die or lose consciousness, or feeling powerless over your fear. Fear of darkness and night often starts in childhood between the ages of three and six. At this point, it may be normal, a normal part of development. It is also common at this age to fear ghosts, monsters, sleeping alone, and strange noises. I right. mean, I feel like you can fear ghosts and monsters to your adult years. Yeah, any age. Additional risk factors include an anxious caregiver, some chur uh, children. Some churros. <laughs> churros. Some children learn to be fearful by seeing a parent's anxiety over certain situations. An overprotective caregiver. Some may develop a generalized anxiety if they're too dependent on a parent. Stressful events such as trauma, motor vehicle accidents, injuries, mm -hmm. and genetics. Some adults and children are simply more susceptible to fears, possibly due to the genetics. Susceptibles to fears in general or susceptible to nyctophobia? To fears in general. Oh. So if you're a pansy. Oh, whoa. Who says pansy? What are you? <laughs> What are you, 60? 60? <laughs> Nyctophobia may be associated with a sleep disorder like insomnia. A small study on college students with insomnia uncovered that nearly half of the students had a fear of the dark. The hmm. researchers measured the students' responses to noises in both light and darkness. Those who had the most trouble sleeping were more easily startled by noise in the dark. Not hmm. only that, but the good sleepers actually became used to the noises with time. The students with insomnia grew more and more anxious and anticipatory. Treatment will include what we've talked about before. Exposure therapy. And cognitive therapy, relaxation, and some medications. Stick them in a room with no lights. That'll, that'll fix them right up. Are you scared now? Are you scared now? And then shake it. Hit it with a stick. <laughs> Hit the box that they're in with a stick. <laughs> Nyctophobia may also be caused by an evolutionary fear. Mm-hmm. As many predators hunt at night, which is, you know, not something we really need to worry about. No, being apex predators ourselves. But what happens when the predators hunt the predators? <gasps> when the predator becomes the prey. Serial killers. Aliens. You know, I've been watching a lot of stuff on orcas lately. Orcas are dope. Orcas are murderers. Orcas are really cool, though. They're not called killer whales for no reason. They fuck people up. Not people. Mm -hmm. Animals. Mm -hmm. uh, symptoms include um, becoming nervous in a darkened environment. What? Being reluctant to go out at night. Experiencing physiological symptoms. Which we talked about. And the need to sleep with a nightlight. Do you sleep with a nightlight? I used to. Actually, I used to sleep with my TV on. Like because you were scared of the dark? On the darkest setting, because I just needed some sort of stimulus while I was sleeping. Mm -hmm. So the lowest brightness setting, and then the lowest volume setting. So I could just barely see it and barely hear it. 
to have something, knowing that something is happening outside. Because I, I was scared of just being asleep in a room with nothing happening. No sound, no light, anything. Mm-hmm. But now it's not a problem. Hmm. Was this like a week ago? Yeah. <laughs> Some researchers, beginning with Sigmund Fraud... <laughs> Consider the fear of the dark to be a manifestation of separation anxiety disorder or sad. Oh, that's sad. You're right. It is. Hmm. An alternate theory was posited. Yeah. Posited. Poisoned. Poison. Poison. In the 1960s, when scientists conducted experiments in a search for molecules. I almost said molecular. Molecules. <laughs> molecules. Molecules. Responsible for memory in one experiment, rats, normally nocturnal, were conditioned to fear the dark. Whoa. That seems fucked up. And a substance called uh, scotophobin, I think, was supposedly extracted from the rats' brains. The substance was claimed to be responsible for remembering this fear. But mm. these findings were subsequently debunked. Interesting. Why are you going to do that to rats? Rats leave, are angels. Leave the rats alone. Mm, that's it, dude. All right. Uh, bruh. That's a good uh, overall en- encompassing definition and You're explanation. Definition. Thanks, I try. Good job, Paige. Yeah. So my section's a little weird. Uh, Why? I think the first thing I looked up is longest periods of time spent in the dark. The dark ages. <laughs> I, I see. I see you. <laughs> and I found a few stories of some people. Uh, first, I'm going to read this article by the Science Explorer that uh, talks about the physiological effects of darkness on humans. Uh-huh. It's called Isolation in the Dark Drives Humans to Brink of Insanity, studies find. This was published November 2015 by Kelly Tatura. Did I tell you that I really want to do a, like a, what's it called? A sleep study? No. Sensory deprivation tank. I want to do that too. I'm curious. Oh, maybe we can both do that. Remember that GMM episode where they did that? No. Yeah, there was a GMM episode, a GMM episode where Rhett and Link did that. I don't that. remember. Yeah, it was pretty cool. I want to do that. You could sleep for days and think it was a nap. We take... Uh, natural light for granted. We don't realize it, but it gets us up in the morning, takes us through our regular day, and its absence sends us into our nightly slumber. So what happens when our body is deprived of light? Very strange things indeed. Two cave explorers, Josie Loris and Antoine Senny, took on a particularly gloomy mission in the name of science, living alone in a dark, desolate cave for months to test the effects of isolation, loneliness, and darkness. They didn't even have the company of one another. They resided in separate caves a few hundred yards apart. The only people Loris and Senny stayed in touch with were researchers at a control point who tracked their sleeping and eating habits, as well as memory and vital signs, according to The Atlantic. Loris, I hope I'm saying that right, and Senny weren't given any insight about how time was passing outside of their dark living holes. Loris like a slow Loris? L-A-U-R-E-S. Loris. 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 Have you seen a slow Loris before? Yes. They're weird. They are weird. When they finally emerged, they had to wear dark goggles to shelter their eyes from the bright sunlight. Oh, no. And their senses of time were insanely warped. Loris spent 88 days in the cave, while Sunny spent 126. When Loris came out of her cave on March 12, 1965, she thought the date was February 25th. Senny's sense of time was even more distorted just a few days before emerging from his cave on April 5th. He thought it was February 4th. In their minds, they'd lost months. Even crazier, the researchers reported that Senny would sleep for stretches of 30 hours at a time, but wake up believing he had just taken a quick nap. Further research done on human physiology and total isolation reveals that humans can even stretch their sleep cycles out for 48 hours. Gross. When it comes down to it, our body's natural cycle and circadian circadian rhythm rely on natural light, and without it, our physiology goes wonky. The same goes for living in complete isolation. Being deprived of interaction of any sort can make us lose our minds. Exhibit A, Tom Hanks making friends with a volleyball in Castaway. 
Do you have, do you know the record for longest time spent awake? Longest time spent awake? Yes. I don't. Without going to sleep. No. 11 days and 25 minutes. Oh, God. That's gross. Why? Ugh. It was a sleep deprivation experiment. Oh, jeez. 11 days. That's gross. 264 hours. And it was a high school student that did it. Motherfucking 17-year-old. They need to be sleeping. Jeez. That's terrible. I stayed awake for like 36 hours and it almost killed me. In fact, Loris and Senny turned to creatures most of us would reject with disgust. Rodents. The Atlantic recapped Senny's experience of spreading jam on the cave floors to try and attract a mouse he could keep as a pet. His attempt went awry after he tried to trap the mouse in a dish and, due to poor aim, accidentally crushed the rodent instead. Loris, more fortunate than Senny, reported that a white mouse was her sole companion throughout the whole ordeal. Since this type of sensory deprivation is often used as a torture technique during wartime, a British study locked up six volunteers in dark, solitary confinement for 48 hours to test its effects. According to the Daily Mail, Adam Bloom, an extroverted stand-up comic, fared particularly terribly. He says at one point he started singing and then suddenly burst into tears, feeling as if his emotions were running out of control. Then, quote, then I found myself suspecting the whole experiment was a trick, he recalls. How did I know who these people really were? What if they'd gone home and I was trapped down here, down here forever? He says that the utter darkness caused him to completely lose his sense of time. He'd doze off and then wake up not knowing whether it was night or day, and even meals didn't help restore a feeling of normalcy. In fact, he and some of the other volunteers actually started hallucinating. A heap of 500 oysters, tiny cars, snakes, zebras, fighter planes, mosquitoes, and even the sensation of the room taking off. How did they specifically know it was 500 oysters? I think he counted when he was hallucinating, and he was able to provide that accurate statistic. Hmm. The BBC went on to produce a documentary using footage of the six volunteers called Total Isolation. Bottom line, humans need light and inter interaction to stay sane. Without light, we lose our sense of time, and without interaction, we become consumed with loneliness and boredom. With this sensory deprivation comes the strangest, most unimaginable psychological effects. Unless you work third shift. In which case, you never see the sun. The sun? What's that? Couldn't tell you. Uh, there are also people who do this for fun or for research. Uh, there's an article from The Guardian. It's called Three Years in a Cave and Trying for Six, published October 2006 by John Hopper. I'm going to read that one, too. It's kind of short. Maurizio Mont Montalbini is it Italy's least gregarious citizen. The 53-year-old sociologist has distinguished himself by spending almost three years of his life in total on his own and underground. Yesterday, Mr. Montalbini vanished into the gloom of a pothole near the eastern Italian town of Ascoli Piceno, Piceno, having instructed his support team that so long as all went well, he should be left undisturbed for another three years. He is already credited with the longest time spent alone underground, more than 12 months between 1992 and 93. So he's a mole person. Correct. By spending lengthy periods alone in the dark, Mr. Montalbini has helped scientists to explore such riddles as, to, as why human beings who are shut away have longer daily cycles. Quote, when I stayed underground for 366 days, I thought that only 219 had passed. He was quoted as telling the La Repubblica. When another Italian hermit, the 27-year-old interior decorator Stefania Follini, lived by herself in a sealed cave for 130 days in 1989, she tended to stay awake for 20 to 25 hours at a time and sleep for about 10 hours. Her menstrual cycle stopped. Similar experiments elsewhere have led to psychological complications and, in one extreme case, a suicide. Oof. Mr. Montalbini plans to while away his time in the Grotta Fredda, literally cold cave, at Aqua Santa Ter Terme. His support team has created a 10 square meter home for him, equipped with running drinking water and an electricity supply to power the array of medical devices that will monitor his physical condition and relay the data to the team on the surface. At night, or rather what he will think is night, Mr. Montalbini will be able to snuggle into an enclosed wooden bunk. Most of his nourishment will come from pills and capsules of the sort used by astronauts. But as a concession to indulgence, he will have with him four kilos of honey, two kilos of walnuts, 
and one and a half kilos of chocolate. You know what kilos are. We don't here. We don't do kilos. They're for the week. Honey, walnuts, and chocolate. That's all you need. That's a lot. He was also... We have a question. Do you know what is a liter? A liter, yeah. What is a liter? A liter in weight? Uh-huh. That's a kilo. That's a kilo. Oh, okay. He was also reported to have a library of 85 books that could be read by the glare of a lamp. Italy's star loner has been toughing it out at intervals over 20 years. In 1987, at the age of 33, he emerged blinking into the light near Ancana to claim the then world record of 210 days underground. His last monumental stint of shadowy inactivity lasted until April 16th, 1998, which he thought was February 9th. Over a period of 166 days, he had lost almost two stones... And never slept for Where'd longer than five hours. He probably had more stones when he went in, oh, okay. and then he he only lost a couple of okay, them. Okay, that's good. Yeah, <laughs> he was able to take the rest of them out. Just with Just a bag of stones, like a bag of marbles. I think yeah, like a basket maybe. Are they smooth stones. I, in a cave, I don't know. What's a stone though? How big is that? Uh, how big is a stone? What's a stone? Stones Europe. No, I meant like you know a stone. Yeah, a stone. Yeah. How big? How big were the stones that he lost? Yeah. Were they like small boulders? That's what I'm saying. Hmm. One stone is 14 pounds. Hmm. So he lost 28 pounds. While he was beneath the surface, the area in which his cave was located was shaken by a major earthquake, and he admitted to the reporters who greeted him on his emergence that, quote, for the first time, I was frightened. Uh, you're underground. Asked eight years ago if he preferred life in the cave, Mr. Montalbini replied, Are you trying to be funny? I'm not going back in there. I need the sun. I used to dream about the dawn. It's an experience I would not repeat. And there are also uh, several cities and towns located in Earth's polar circles, um, the north and the south polar circles, that experience 24-hour night cycles, anywhere from three to nine weeks. Wow. During these periods of time, the sun remains below the horizon. So the sun never comes up <coughs> for three to nine weeks. Jesus. Most of these cities and towns, uh, there's some in Norway, there's a town in Alaska, uh, some in Russia. Most of these cities and towns don't experience total darkness, of course, since the light from the sun refracts enough to provide an adequate amount of light similar to twilight. But the lack of sunlight can still have some negative psychological effects on some residents of these towns, according to a few articles that I read. Suicide, depression, and substance abuse is common in some areas that experience this, quote, polar night. That's what it's called, polar night. Why do people like living in those areas? I don't know. There's a town in Alaska, the northernmost point of Alaska. It used to be called Barrow, but they changed their name to the old Inuit um, oh, yeah, name that, that, yeah. the, that the city had. They experience a polar night of a few weeks, I think. Hmm. So, it's crazy. I'm glad that we get day and night cycles here consistent, but the weather sucks. Yeah. It's I'm like negative six soon. outside. I'm going to move soon. Booty. That's my section. Oh, thank God. It's over. It's over. It's finally over. We We're can free. stop drinking the beer and talking about oh, it. Oh, thank God. What did you think hey! of the beer? Hey. That was very loud in my ears. Don't you ask that fucking question. That's my question. That's my thing. What did you think of the beer, Zach? Uh, um, I, I liked it. An asshole. <laughs> I liked it. Just have it on my toes. I liked it. It was, um, yeah, I can taste the coffee. I can taste a little bit of chocolate in there. It's some roasty, roasty, mm. toasty. Roasty, it's got some roasty, toasty going on. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I guess like the sweetness, a little bit of the, the fruit I can kind of pick up, but... The smell is wonderful. The smell, it smells like coffee. Thick mouth feel. <laughs> a little bit of bitterness in there on the finish. But just, it's good. It's like a coffee beer, but it's an Imperial Russian stout. Russian mm. Imperial stout. What about you? Blech. All right. Beer and fear cast. <laughs> 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 I just, I didn't get the smell that you were getting. And the taste was just really not pleasant on my tongue. Mm. I just don't like stouts, man. I don't feel like beer should be thick. Thick. I don't think that's right. 
Um, it's an affront to my very nature. Well, that's the, oh, it's got some stumps, too. That's the magic of beer, is that there's so many different ways to Don't do it. Don't spill. I'm not going to spill. You spill all the time. You're right. There's so many different ways to do it, though. And um, it's nice to have a, something different. Are you drunk? Then. Should I be worried about you? I'll be okay. Okay. Put okay. that down. Okay. Now. No more. Yeah, I didn't like it. I'm sorry. It's a world-class beer. It gets a 10. World-class beer. Ranked Not a 10 out of 10. 99. 99. Okay, the internet doesn't know what it's talking about. Beerandfearcast.com is our website. Thanks. You can watch our video episodes that we record congruently with our audio episodes. You can watch those live on YouTube while we record. Yeah. While we're drinking the beer. Yeah. You can watch them. Yeah. Um, and then if you follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Reddit, TikTok, you can stay up to date with our uh, weekly releases. We release new episodes every Wednesday at noon Central Time, 12 p.m. Central Time. And then you can watch the video episode again or listen in or whatever. Yeah. You know, whatever you want to no do. No pressure. And then our, if you go on our website, click on the About page. There's a contact form you can fill out if you want to reach out to us. Also, beerandfearcast at gmail.com is where you can email us. If you want to say, ho, oh, what up? Could up. That's all we got. 67. Darkness. Surly. Stouts. Okay.